glad to present your speaker, Brother Guy N. Woods. On every occasion when we assemble for the purpose of singing God's praises, engaging in petition to His name, and studying His Word, we worship Him. But we will see from our lesson today that it's possible for one to assemble and assemble for the purpose of worshiping and of actually worshiping, and yet not doing so acceptably. Because the Bible teaches us that there's more than one way in order to worship God. That one way and one alone is right, and that any other is wrong. And consequently, the very fact of one's having worshipped is no guarantee that his worship is pleasing in God's sight. This points up then how vital it is for us not only to know what acceptable worship is, but to be certain that we engage in it when together we assemble. I think the best brief definition of the word worship that can be advanced is found in the American Standard Version in a footnote at the very beginning of the book of Matthew, in which it is said that worship consists of acts of devotion to God. Now, I call your attention to that definition because it's a vital one. What is worship? It's devotion. But that's not all. Many people think it is. The average person in the world today thinks that if you have a reverent attitude, if you feel in a pious fashion that this is what worship is, that it's simply an attitude toward God. But notice, if you will, that the definition says that it consists of acts of devotion. This devotion must not only exist, but it must also express itself in acts. Quite obviously, that's not enough. That there may be devotion. That devotion may express itself in acts. But then note the rest of the definition. Acts that are approved of God. Unless these acts are approved of God, though they may be devotional, though they may constitute acts, they're not acceptable in His sight. Hence, our devotion to God must be approved. It must consist of acts that God approves. And, of course, this comes only by doing what he said in his word. In order for us to worship him pleasingly, then, we must know what he has authorized in order that we may be able to do so. Our English word worship is a contraction of the old English word worship. And that within itself is indicative of its present meaning. When we engage in acts of devotion, we do so in recognition of our obligation to God. We do so in view of His right to receive these acts of devotion. And we do so because we feel that it's our obligation as well as our privilege so to do. And so today I wanted us to study this vital matter because every time we assemble, we engage in worship. But we must be sure that our worship is pleasing in His sight. The word worship often appears in the New Testament well over a hundred times. The most common of these words is a word that means literally to kiss the hand toward which in Oriental countries to this very day is an act of um, recognition of worthiness on the part of another. And, of course, figuratively used means 
that feeling that we have that God deserves our devotion and of our desire and our obligation to engage in it. And so we want to begin today with a study of what acceptable worship is. But before we're prepared for that, we must know the difference between various kinds of worship. There are three different kinds that are mentioned in the Bible and mentioned for the purpose of warning us against them. We read, for example, in the 15th chapter of the book of Matthew about the Pharisees whom the Lord severely rebuked when he said to them, In vain do you worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He had said earlier than this, This people draweth nigh to me with their mouth, they honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Then he added, In vain do you worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Note, if you will, one, they were worshiping. Note, secondly, that they were worshiping God. But note, thirdly, that they were doing so in vain. The word vain means that which is empty, void of no benefit. Hence, though they were worshiping and worshiping God, they were doing so in a fashion not acceptable. Here again, this shows us that there is a type of worship that's vain, empty, void of benefit. Note, if you will, what is said with reference to them. They draw near to me with their mouth. They say things that are calculated to be worshipful, but their heart is far from them. This evidence is the fact that people may say and engage in acts of devotion, yet not be pleasing to God. A second type that's mentioned and mentioned to warn us against it. It's found in the 17th chapter of Acts. On the occasion of Paul's visit to the city of Athens, and particularly to Mars Hill, I have a very vivid recollection of having stood on Mars Hill and having read this speech that Paul delivered on that occasion. You remember that he said, among other things, I perceive that you're very religious. Because as I passed by and saw your devotions, I saw in all of this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you worship in ignorance, him declare I unto you. Here again, note that they were worshiping. But note that the text says that they were worshiping in ignorance. Now, note very carefully that that doesn't mean that's far from meaning that they were ignorant people. Though they were worshiping ignorance, they were far from being ignorant people. As a matter of fact, they were among some of the most educated people of the world. At that time, Athens was the very center of learning of the world. Some of the greatest universities of all time were in Athens at that very time. They were far from being ignorant people, or for that matter, far from being uneducated people. Nonetheless, they were worshiping in ignorance. That shows us, friends, that people may know a great deal about a lot of things, and yet not know how to worship God acceptably. Well, we see it all around us. People who have the highest accreditations, who by the world standard would be far from being regarded as ignorant people, but who worship God in ignorance. This shows us that a person cannot stumble upon acceptable worship to God, that it requires a knowledge of what worship, true worship is in order for us to be sure that we're pleasing God. A third instance in which worship is mentioned, and mentioned to warn us against it, is found in Colossians, the second chapter. On this occasion, a problem had arisen in the church with reference to the matter of eating meat. 
and that had been offered to idols. Bear in mind that there were idol temples in that day in which sacrifices were offered. After the sacrifice was over, the meat was carried to the marketplace and put on sale for food. It was perfectly wholesome food. It was not contaminated. It wouldn't make you sick if you ate it. But some of the brethren felt it would be wrong to eat meat that had had such heathen association. So they laid down some rules. They said, touch not, taste not, handle not. This created a problem in the church. The matter was submitted to Paul for solution. Paul said that their position, those objectors, had a show of wisdom in will worship. That is, on the surface it looked like they had a point. But then he added, it's after the doctrines of men. In other words, the Lord had not spoken thereon. Men had no right to do so. He said that the effort involved will worship, an unusual term. That is, worship originating in the human will, an act performed from no higher motive than the desire or the origination of the, of the worshiper, an act which the worshiper conceives as proper to be devoted to God. Remarkably, that's the sole test by which people in the world determine the acceptability of an act. They do not ask, is this authorized? Did our Lord sanction it? Did some New Testament church practice it? These matters don't concern them. They raise but one question. Does it please me? If the answer is yes, that to them is sufficient. That is positive proof that it's not sufficient. Because we've already seen that worship in order to be acceptable must be approved. And it's approved only if God authorizes it. Therefore, however much it may have committed itself to their judgment, it was still will worship, and therefore not pleasing. So we must avoid vain worship, empty, ritualistic worship. Secondly, worship in ignorance, that is, worship that proceeds from an individual who doesn't know what the book teaches. And thirdly, will worship allowing the human will to determine the acts of worship rather than what the Bible has to say. Fortunately, there is a type of worship that God approves. In John, the fourth chapter, we have an account of the Lord's journey to Galilee through Samaria, stopping at the well of Jacob, his conversation with a woman at the well, of their discussion, ultimately, with reference to the place of worship. She says, Our fathers worship in this mountain. And undoubtedly, when she said that, she pointed toward Gerizim. They stood at that point, very close to Mount Ebal, Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Cursing, the Mount of Blessing. Incidentally, there's a remarkable natural phenomenon in the valley between those two mountains. There must be a considerable distance across from one mountain to the other, across a beautiful valley. But the acoustics are so perfect that one can stand and read in a normal voice without amplification and be heard all the way across that valley. This is the place where the blessings and the cursings were read on the occasion of Israel being assembled there in the long ago. When Brother J.W. McGarvey made his famed trip to the Holy Land, now well over a hundred years ago, and yet wrote what is, I think, the definitive work on it even to this day, he tested that and determined that by reading it a normal voice, one all, all the way across the valley, under conditions that would have been almost impossible under, in other climates and under circumstances, could be heard. 
At any rate, this is where they were near this particular spot. The woman said, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. She was a Samaritan. It was characteristic of them to worship in a temple that they had built on Gerizim. They still do. I remember meeting an old Samaritan on Gerizim who had in his possession a manuscript, which he said was one of the original manuscripts of the Law of Moses. Of course, he was wrong about that. He said he himself was a cousin of Aaron. I think he said 127 times removed. A good long ways removed, I think, to count Ken. At any rate, he was a true descendant of the Samaritans. But the woman continuing, you say we ought to worship in Jerusalem. You, being a Jew, would maintain that only in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. So she sought to raise the argument that had long existed between the Jews and the Samaritans about the proper place of worship. Our Lord said to her, woman, the hour is coming and now is, when you shall neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. By which he meant this, the time is near when the place, so far as the temple is concerned, will lose significance. When wherever the Lord's people assemble, they can engage in acceptable worship to God. Then he set out the rules of acceptable worship. Here they are. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What are the rules? Number one, we must devote our worship to God. Number two, we must do so in spirit, that is, in the, with the proper motive. Number three, we must do so in truth, that is, according to His Word. Let's look at each one of those. First of all, our worship must be directed to God. This was the great failure of the Athenians. Though they were trying to include God among their deities, they were simply doing that, simply making Him one among others. Not knowing His identity, they had set up an image to the unknown God. Their failure was, of course, in not worshiping the true God of the Bible. Any worship rendered otherwise, of course, is not acceptable. A great deal of worship today that has as its object materialism, worldliness, pleasure, the enjoyment of the things of this life rather than the next, would all fall under that condemnation. Secondly, it must not only be directed to God, it must be in the proper spirit. That is prompted by the right motive. It must be sincere. And remarkably, many people today, particularly in the denominational world, think there's little significance in that, that it's largely ceremonial, mechanical, ritualistic in nature. Much worship that's engaged in these days is ritualistic. Some religious bodies have gone wholly to ritualism. For example, the Mohammedans, in their prayers, which they think must be uttered on specified occasions and in certain numbers, they have speeded the process by attaching prayers written out to a wheel, the spokes of the wheel, and then they spin the wheel assuming that they speed, speed up the matter considerably in that fashion. That to us is ridiculous. The Jews, for example, they operate on the theory that it's the mechanical participation rather than the heart that involves the responsibility. I recall years and years ago when I 
was still doing local work in Texas. And I had a very close association with a Jewish rabbi, a very talented man, from whom for many months I took lessons in Hebrew. Occasionally I would go out to his um, services on Friday evening, and I observed that in their services a portion of their activity consisted of reading prayers from a prayer book and that some of the prayers were in Hebrew, and that their people, for the most part, being born and raised in this country, knew no Hebrew. Nonetheless, they had to say these prayers in Hebrew. But this hurdle they accomplished by simply spelling out the Hebrew words in English letters and putting diacritical marks over them so that they could pronounce the words though they didn't understand what a, one, a single one of them meant. I said to them, I see why you think this would be of any value to them, because they don't know what they're saying. And he said, it doesn't make any difference whether they know what they're saying or not. And just so they say it. The important thing, he said, was the saying it, not whether they understood it or not. And I said, it looks to me like it'd get a little monotonous say the same prayers over all the time, especially if you didn't know what you were saying. Well, he thought a moment, and he said, well, you drink water every day, too, but that doesn't get monotonous. To him, it was simply the matter of performing the obligation without regard to any heart participation. This violated, of course, the sincerity part. We must be careful, friends. We don't do the same thing. It's easy for us today in the partaking of the emblems not to reflect while so doing on that which they signify. Or when someone leads in prayer to fail to follow the sentiment. When we call upon somebody to lead the prayer, this is not to take care of that part of the worship while we wait until that part's over. The purpose is for someone to express sentiments audibly so that we may follow them. And at the end, if we don't say so out loud, at least to God, amen, meaning with that, those are my sentiments. If we don't do that, we don't worship acceptably. The same thing is true with all the Adam's worship, our singing. When we sing these songs, we ought to follow the lyrics and make them our own as much as if we were actually composing. I've heard great audiences sing songs that involved absurdities without any recognition, whatever, of what they were saying. Now, there's a song, I'm not sure it's in this book, I don't much think it is, it may well be. But at any rate, the title of it is, I Hold His Hand, beautiful music. But it has in the chorus these words, Where still waters flow. Where still waters flow. Waters that are flowing are not still. Waters that are still are not flowing. Here's a contradiction of terms. I've heard great audiences sing that song without any recognition of absurdity. How can a person do that and be singing in spirit and in truth? To cap the climax, several years ago I was conducting a meeting in a New Mexico town. The song leader who wrote that music, who wrote the music to that song, was with me as we rode out to a place to have lunch. I called his attention to that absurdity. Ask him why it was they injected it into the song. He thought for a moment, he said, I never had noticed that before. You're the man who wrote the music to the song. And not even recognize the contradictory sentiment. This emphasizes the point that I'm making. We must be sincere in our effort. Our heart must be in it.
Then, thirdly, we must worship God in truth. On the Lord's Day, there are five items. Singing, teaching, the contribution, the Lord's Supper, and prayer. All of these must be measured by the rules set out. All of these must be engaged in and devoted to God, in the right spirit, and in harmony with His Word. But then, on every occasion, in addition to the Lord's Day, Sunday evening, Wednesday evening, we sing and pray, read His Word, teach His Word. We're worshiping God. Whether we're worshiping Him acceptably depends on us. What kind of worship are you rendering to your Creator?